So good evening to all the attendees. Good evening to good evening to the panelists who are joining us from the U.S. Uh, for the Knowledge at KPD Admissions 101 Workshop Series session, the topic for the day is preparing your application for engineering programs and maximizing research opportunities. Uh, we have Miss Elizabeth Lawrence from Minnesota State University, Mankato, Rashad Housey from Missouri Western State University. Scott McClama from Pepperdine University and UC Wahid from Stony Brook, you know, sunny Stony Brook University. And as I mentioned, they will be presenting on the session topic, preparing your application for engineering programs and maximizing research opportunities. Having said that, what we're going to be doing is the first 30 minutes is going to be about the session topic. And the next 30 minutes is going to be about, um, you know, about the institution information that the four panelists would love to share with you. And last uh, but not the very least, at the end of the session, we'll be having a QA and section where you can answer your questions. And of course, as the universities, I would like to hear from you. If you can share your email addresses, that would be wonderful as well. Having said that, I'm going to hand over the stage as well as the microphone to um, the wonderful panelists so that they can begin with their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kunal. Um, again, I would like to thank Kunal and his team at KPT for allowing us to present to you today. And like Kunal said, we're um, focusing on applications for engineering programs, um, as well as an overview of the STEM programs as well, and then maximizing research opportunities that you would have throughout your bachelor degree program if you choose to pursue that in the U.S. Um, and so, as Kunal mentioned, we have four universities represented um, from Missouri Western State University. We have Rashad, Scott from Pepperdine University, UC Wahib from um, SUNY Stony Brook, and of course, I'm Elizabeth from Minnesota State University, Mankato. So, if uh, you're joining us today as part of this presentation, you probably um, saw the title and hopefully it piqued your interest um, thinking about pursuing an engineering program or at least looking at a STEM program within U.S. higher education. Um, and so, of course, if you are a student who is looking at one of those programs and trying to make up your mind about what is the best um, program to apply for within the United States um, and pursuing STEM education, this is a great presentation for you to get an overview of what that could look like um, as you pursue your bachelor degree in the United States. So of course, what is STEM? Um, you're probably very familiar with this, but it, the basics are, it stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So it's the combination of four specific fields of study that have been combined to focus on real world um, problems and finding real world solutions in the 21st century. So a lot of the programs that you would pursue um, within US higher education, if it's in the STEM field, those disciplines will overlap in some way. Um, but since we're focusing on engineering um, today, let's look at what putting that E in STEM looks like. So that E of course is engineering. Um, and engineering uh, is essential for um, health and safety and improving overall quality of life. So when you think of engineers, you might have a broad idea of what an engineer actually does. You might have a vision of somebody wearing a hard hat, um, and a safety vest and safety goggles in a laboratory or maybe out in the field doing um, different projects, maybe a civil engineer or an automotive engineer. But really there's engineers across so many different disciplines and it's impacted all of our lives in so many different ways. So most likely if you're joining us today, you might be using a laptop or maybe a tablet or a smartphone. Um, there was engineering that went into that technology that allows us to even be able to connect today across the internet, across the world. That is something that engineers do. Um, they find the real world solutions to solve our everyday problems, to keep us connected and to keep us healthy and safe. Um, engineers have the challenge of being creative, but also designing under constraint because of course they have to design for the real world um, under the laws, uh, the natural laws of sciences. Um, and so there is that challenge where they're focused on um, creatively solving those problems, whether it's small problems within their community, um, maybe developing better water quality in their community or safer sewers or safer um, disposal of trash in landfills to much larger problems across the world, such as food security, um, climate change, those are the types of problems and challenges 
that engineers face on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you're thinking about pursuing a field and uh, a career in STEM um, and a major in engineering, those are the types of uh, problems that you would have the opportunity to find solutions for. So if you're thinking of that field, ultimately your role as an engineer will be to help shape the future. So why is STEM and engineering so popular and important? It's for all those reasons that I mentioned, um, creatively solving the world's most pressing problems. And so as a student in engineering, you will be at the forefront of studying these problems. And hopefully you would have ideas already of areas that you might wanna work on in your local communities or maybe worldwide problems that you wanna be part of the solution. So that's the, the challenge and the creativity behind our students who are going into our engineering programs. But of course, there's also the tangible benefits of going into engineering programs. Because engineers do work across many different fields and many different disciplines, solving those day-to-day -day problems, there's employability for um, in-demand careers. So whether you're thinking civil engineering, computer engineering, automotive engineering, petroleum engineering, any one of those disciplines, there will be openings um, uh, and many job prospects for students coming from their bachelor degree program. Of course, for entry level positions, a bachelor degree is fine for most um, uh, engineering students, but later on, you might also want to consider going on for a graduate degree to specialize within your engineering field to open up more higher ability opportunities. Um, but also engineering is so popular for many students because it does have one of the highest starting salaries for entry level positions. So not only are you able to have job security, but you're also able to start out with a very good living salary and wage. And then of course within US higher education, um, graduates of STEM majors can actually pursue multiple career paths. So again, thinking about the different um, career pathways within across the disciplines of engineering whether you're going for civil engineering, computer engineering, automotive, um, mechanical engineering, you have multiple career paths that you can pursue um, throughout your bachelor degree as you're thinking about focusing in on your specialization. So when you're coming into US higher education specifically, you'll be able to take some introductory engineering courses and potentially change um, the direction of your engineering major as you're able to um, learn more about the field learn more about your skill set and how you might be able to best use that in one of the engineering disciplines. And then also a benefit, um, a tangible benefit for international students studying engineering in US higher education is the optional practical training opportunities. Many students want to get hands on experience after their degree program and students within STEM um, have that extension of up to 36 months or in total three years for work authorization after their degree program. So you could come to the US, pursue your bachelor degree, and then apply for that three year additional work authorization in the United States. And so that's made um, STEM programs very popular as well for many students around the world. So thinking about that, I am going to transition to my colleague to talk about how to prepare for STEM programs. Thank you so much, uh, Liz. Hello, everyone. So now you know what is what the STEM stand for. You know uh, how to how to like you know what is what is it about and what everything stands for. So um, the question now is. How do I get admitted to engineering programs? How do I get admitted to any STEM program that I want to be uh, pursuing in terms of studying at the university level? So here's the first thing you need to know. Take math every year. Uh, so when we say math, preferably calculus, we know that some educational systems do not have calculus classes, but it could be pro probably combined with math. So uh, take math every year. So that's calculus, A-level or high-level IB math for at least two years. The second thing, take lab science courses, and that includes physics, chemistry, biology. You're going to tell me here, well, listen, due to COVID, how can I that the chances are very limited that we will be having lab science courses. Uh, please keep in mind that we understand it because this is not only, this is something that is affecting the whole world. So we know this already, so it shouldn't be a problem at all. Participate in extracurricular activities, 
um, that is STEM related. And here we mentioned like clubs, competitions that could be like a math, science, Olympiads, robotics clubs. Uh, you can join like uh, any, any organization that involves students in the STEM related uh, fields. And there's a lot of computer science clubs as well. Uh, take a rigorous curriculum. Um, that could be an honors AP, IB, A level. Um, things to consider as well that include um, having large classes then in high school, uh, lab hours that are intensive and more independent if undecided between a STEM program and humanities program, it is easier to switch out of a STEM program to humanities. So keep that in mind. Because even though like if you want if you come here and you change your mind that stem it's a little hard or something and you want to change back to humanities that's definitely a an easy thing to uh to do when coming here uh to the united states also uh you may want to say like oh what if i just like uh, apply general and i decide to do that when i get to uh to the us to the university um, let me tell you that chances will be limited because STEM field, there's a high demand on STEM field when it comes to students applying. So the priority will be given to freshman students that are applied. And then if we have spots, we will offer it to students that will be changing from general to that. Uh, so it's very important to make up your mind way before at the, at the senior level, before you apply to any STEM program. Um, Okay, and of course, as one of the, one of the advice that we all believe in is um, be a lifelong uh, learner. So uh, now that you know how to prepare for STEM field, I'm going to give you a very pretty simple example. At Stony Brook University, for example, um, if you want to apply for computer science, uh, what do we need? So there is either you get a direct admission to the program or you direct you get admitted indirectly. Getting directly admitted to computer science, for example. Uh, you need to have a certain uh, GPA. We do require, for example, like a minimum of 90 GPA. Uh, we do need that you have taken calculus for at least for the last two years. Uh, A-level, high-level will be highly recommended. Uh, we do need to see that you have also taken some science classes, either physics, chemistry, or biology for at least the last two years. So, and then we do look at your SAT. Uh, for example, last year we required a minimum of 700 in the SAT math section if you want to get directly admitted. Now, because of COVID, we're all going to be uh, uh, test optional. So there will be no need for SAT, but it doesn't mean you don't have to, but a lot of students will be able actually to do and sit for the SATs. If you can do that, of course do that because you will be given the uh, uh, the priority to be accepted to that program that will definitely add a plus that will definitely add a, uh, a power to your application in getting it directly admitted to computer science or any STEM program. So that's what we look at. So math, uh, sciences, and also a good GPA and SAT maths. We look at the math section specifically, and that will give you a direct admission. If you don't have these, doesn't mean don't apply for computer science do apply for computer science. You will still be admitted, but indirectly. What does that mean is you will be taking some uh, extra classes first before you get mainstreamed. With that, we go to the next slide. Great, so here you see uh, on the screen research in engineering uh, programs. Just looking at this title here, we see two very important components. One is research and two is engineering. So let's focus now um, for, on engineering. Uh, we as admissions counselor, we know that this is the favorite field of study for a lot of Indian students. We all agree on that. We appreciate that. And we were actually very much uh, like that. Uh, a lot of students and excel really good in engineering programs and research. Simply because engineering is a broad field that offers exciting career opportunities when you will get to be creative, solve problems, and explore how things work every day. Uh, one of the reasons as well is because engineering are constantly in high demand, uh, so you will enjoy fantastic graduate employment prospects, high in income potential, and of course research showed that we there's uh, at the minimum uh, salary that you will get when applying to any engineering job after graduating, of course, uh, would be like as, min as, as less as $60,000 per year. So now with research, your dream is like 
likely to come true and, and, and easy to reach. So when doing research, why you study in engineering, that will definitely help you and open a lot of doors. Why? Because you had that kind of hands-on experience that will enable any employer uh, to actually give you a chance to join their organization. Uh, and uh, engineer research is really critical to any organization's productivity and competitiveness. For wireless communications to robotics, biomedical engineering, sustainable energy, and so on and so forth. So at the undergraduate research, uh, when we say undergraduate research, there could be lab codes, test tubes, uh, but that only a narrow slice of the whole experience. So undergraduate research um, extend across disciplines. So taking many forms and offerings benefits, regardless of the major experts. So uh, basically what experts say is nothing that such work helps students develop a variety of skills that employers actually value and, and look for. So um, at the graduate research, most graduate students, at least in the natural sciences, have a source of financial support that pays their tuition and small living stipend. Although nobody um, ever got rich being a graduate student, you probably won't starve either because uh, when you get involved in graduate research, so basically there is a lot of chances where you could get uh, money. So whether through a professor who is already involved in research or through those uh, kind of uh, organizations that actually funds research for uh, particular universities and that, and when I say organizations here, uh, that that include uh, fellowships from uh, National Science Foundation, universities, uh, government agencies, and industries. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, good morning, good, good evening for you. Good morning for me. Um, happy to be uh, with you today uh, to start my day off uh, sharing with you. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about something maybe you might not have been thinking of, uh, but uh, that is uh, studying engineering at a liberal arts institution. Um, as you may already know, uh, there are in the United States, uh, higher education, there are a lot of different ways to uh, earn a given degree, um, you know, with over uh, 4,000 different higher ed education institutions uh, in the United States. Um, you can imagine that, that then, and probably why you're here watching this video is because there's lots of different options and there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, uh, studying engineering at a liberal arts institution, um, as opposed to, um, you know, a, a more kind of uh, a larger research-based uh, institution. So. Um, first, I want to talk about what is, uh, what is liberal arts education. Um, so liberal arts education, um, and there have been a lot of uh, people that have come along, tried to define it. Um, I'm just going to talk about some characteristics that mark uh, a liberal arts education. And so the first thing is, um, as you see, there is breadth and depth. Um, this is kind of the idea that, uh, that, that all the students need to start with kind of a, a broader base uh, of education. Um, so this example is, is a T-shaped student. So you kind of have uh, the broad set um, up at the top and then uh, your, then you have a focus that goes down. So um, a, a broad base of, uh, of general uh, education. Um, so learning different kinds of things, definitely the sciences and math, uh, but also the humanities um, and, and writing. Um, and then from that, uh, you build uh, your, your, your particular set, skill set of expertise. Um, which would be the, the T part um, going down there. Um, that should be noted, so liberal arts is, is the foundation of, uh, of higher education uh, in the United States. So the first higher education institutions in the US were, were, were liberal arts uh, institutions. Uh, and even you know, larger, larger research, big, big large uh, uh, um, uh, state schools uh, still have elements of, of liberal arts um, in them at their, at their, at their core uh, even. So, you know, it, it, even if you go to MIT, you still have to take uh, an English class. Um, uh, so the next, uh, I guess, uh, part of, of liberal arts, the next uh, characteristic of it is, um, is you learn uh, not just what to learn, but how to learn. So it's teaching the skills of how to continue to kind of be a, a lifelong learner. Um, and, and through that, you develop certain core competencies. Uh, as you see there, critical thinking, 
communication, uh, leadership, teamwork, uh, networking, uh, creativity. Um, so those are those are really kind of the, the core values that the liberal arts education seeks to instill, uh, regardless of, of what uh, your particular major is, what your particular focus of study is. Uh, it's trying to, to teach people to continue to learn. So, you know, they could go off and, and uh, go to a graduate school and get something, get a different kind of degree that's different from, from their bachelor's degree. Um, you know, so it, it's really kind of preparing you to, to be kind of flexible in that sense. Um, so now why, why would you consider, uh, why, why might you consider studying engineering at a liberal arts institution um, as opposed to um, a traditional uh, kind of, you know, larger school of engineering at a much larger institution? Um, so a lot of uh, liberal arts schools are, are tend to be smaller in size, um, like the, the institution where I work, uh, Pepperdine University um, is the smallest of the four of our, our universities that's presenting here today. Uh, we have around 3,500 students in our undergraduate student body. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this has to do with kind of what is your preference for your, your educational preference and your learning style and, and what you're comfortable with and, and what you tend to thrive in, what kind of uh, educational environment. Um, so for a lot of people, that is a smaller size where you get to work uh, very closely with, with faculty. Um, you know, it's a, it means uh, not just small class sizes, uh, but also, um, you know, the availability of faculty uh, to, to be there to, to participate in research uh, opportunities uh, with faculty. Um, so, um, you know, you may find that uh, working closer with them is, is something that you, you really value. Um, also, flexibility. Um, coming in, you can come into uh, a lot of those institutions, um, you know, as undecided um, uh, and, and then choose and opt into the uh, to uh, the engineering uh, major, um, you know. So there's a there's a, a lot of these institutions. There's not a, a liberal arts institution. You don't um, you, you apply to one uh, undergraduate school um, as opposed to you know the College of Engineering and the college or you know the College of Arts and Sciences. It's not necessarily separate like that. So uh, you're all together in the same undergraduate college uh, with um, with all the students of the university, and so. Um, there's some flexibility and in, in, uh, greater flexibility in being able to change your major uh, or add a, a double major or a minor um, uh, of something that hasn't doesn't have anything to do with your with your first major. Um, you know, making those kind of uh, cross discipline uh, connections, uh, if you will. Um, and, uh, you know, so you could be an engineering uh, made dub double major in engineering and dance, for example. Um, you know, something that, uh, you know, doesn't ha necessarily have anything to do with it, or maybe you're, you find that you make that, that connection between those two uh, somehow. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, finally, um, uh, maybe some broader career prospects uh, of, of earning your degree at a liberal arts uh, institution. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, because you, you, it works on developing these core, uh, these core competencies, um, it gives you a, a little bit more flexibility in your career. So, uh, you know, uh, when you graduate college, you may not be able to get in right away to that particular engineering job that you're looking for. Um, you may have to take a job doing something else before you, you know, get to that um, or, you know, or an adjacent position. Um, and, and having developed those, those kind of skills um, to, you know, it shows a, a broader base, uh, you know, rather than just a very specific focus, uh, increases your likelihood of, of being able to uh, to get a job in something uh, that's not necessarily specific to the exact field that you're looking for. Uh, so, it, and it really does prepare you, you know, later on, if you, if you decide to change careers, um, it really gives you that preparation for, you know, a second, third or fourth career. Um, Cause uh, nowadays, uh, you know, at least uh, people don't, uh, don't just, you know, commit and stay in one career immediately after they graduate, they, they kind of shift around and move around to some different things. And, and so having this broad set of, of skills uh, and, and knowledge um, and, and learning how to learn new things uh, is really a great way to, to kind of set you up for that. Um, and, and developing these soft skills is something that the employers have actually, you know, come out and said that they, that they really desire and they, they highly desire um, liberal arts students because they have this ability, um, not just, you know, to do their job in their specific field, but to be able to communicate uh, and to work with, um, you know, maybe people in the company that are in a completely different department. 
so, you know, a great example of this is uh, when I think about Steve Jobs and, and Apple. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he had a statement that, uh, that he said, you know, technology, uh, technology is not enough. Um, it's, uh, it's technology married with uh, liberal arts. Uh, married with the humanities that that yields the the results that we're looking for, and so he was very famous for for kind of making sure that uh, you know the employees that were you know in the more like kind of hard science uh, part of, of his companies uh, were working together um, uh, together with the the more artistic uh, uh, employees uh, and the ones that were kind of working on that that kind of design. So um, you know that kind of gives you I guess a good real world application uh, for that. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about, um, you know, uh, preparing to apply uh, to a liberal arts uh, institution. Um, and, and I'll also add, you know, another, uh, perhaps another reason why uh, you would want to go this route um, as an engineering major uh, is Yusuf got done, uh, you know, as Yusuf was uh, speaking about, um, you know, applying uh, and, and taking, you know, particular um, prerequisite math courses, making sure that you take math every year. Um, and you want to make sure that, you know, you have you know, high maths and, and high level maths, especially if you're doing IB. Uh, this is a good option, you know, for you, maybe if you've decided late, um, you know, in your, your, your final year or, or your, you know, second to last year of high school that, um, that you want to, that you are interested in doing engineering, but uh, you haven't, you know, maybe done all of those courses that, uh, that would, would set you up to do that. This is a good option for, uh, for students uh, in, in that, you know, that maybe don't have, haven't taken math every year. Um, because uh, when you apply to a liberal arts institution, uh, you apply to the school. Um, you don't just uh, apply to that specific major. And so, and, you know, like I said, you can even apply undecided and then choose uh, to, to, to make, make your major engineering. And so um, this is a good way to kind of get in at that level if, if maybe you haven't been thinking about doing engineering for very long. Um, and, and so one thing to consider is that there are a, a number of different kinds of, of engineering programs uh, that are available to you at liberal arts institutions. So there's a traditional, you know, four year, um, you know, like, like anywhere else. Um, but uh, also there are uh, what's called a 3-2 program. Uh, this is where you can earn uh, two bachelor's degrees um, you, uh, so you actually, um, go for three years at, uh, at the liberal arts institution. Um, you earn a, a bachelor's degree, for example, at our institution, we have a three, two program. Um, you go for three years at Pepperdine, you earn a bachelor's degree in natural science. And then for the re remaining two years of the program, uh, you can attend uh, the, the school of engineering at uh, one of our institutions that we partner with. So we have for us, that would be uh, University of Southern California and Washington University in St. Louis. Um, you go there for two years, and then you earn your specific uh, engineering degree. So um, you have two bachelor's, so it's a, a three, two dual bachelor's degree. You get two bachelor's degrees in five years, um, and, uh, and you get your specific bachelor's degree from one of those other institutions. Uh, so as I mentioned, our institution does that. There's a lot of other um, uh, smaller liberal arts schools that kind of have the same uh, setup as well. Um, and then some have uh, a 3-3, three, three, uh, which is a bachelor's and a master's. So you go that extra year uh, and you come away with uh, a master's degree uh, in addition to those uh, bachelor's degrees. Uh, so as I mentioned before, when you are applying to a liberal arts institution, you will apply to the school and not uh, the specific major. You can indicate what major you would like, um, but you're not applying to you know, the, the College of Engineering. You're just applying to that, um, that university. Um, uh, you want to demonstrate academic strength across the board. Uh, so, you know, while, you know, it, it would be good for you to, that you have the skills of being strong in, in math and science, um, to, to, uh, to get in and be admitted to a liberal arts institution, uh, you can't really be unbalanced in, in, in how, uh, you know, how well you do academically. Uh, so you want to be able to, to demonstrate that strength. And that kind of goes hand in hand with um, avoiding, uh, you know, a narrow focus of interest or specialization. So um, not just in your academics, but in your extracurriculars too. So you kind of want to demonstrate uh, that you are um, open uh, to learning uh, new things that are maybe a little bit outside of your, 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 your wheelhouse, uh, if you will, um, and, and that you are able and competent to kind of uh, learn uh, new things. Um, and that kind of uh, shows that and demonstrates that. So um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about, um, you know, uh, applying to a liberal arts institution and, and studying engineering there. 
Um, we are going to move on at this point uh, to my colleague, Rashad, to tell you a little bit more. All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rashad. I'm just going to uh, kind of talk to you about uh, service learning within your engineering STEM programs. Uh, so when we talk about uh, service learning, I'll give you guys a little bit of a uh, definition. Um, a lot of times, uh, obviously, students want to be able to get uh, you know, practical information within the field that they're going to be working in. And service learning is definitely one of those uh, things that students will be able to do. So I'm just going to go across uh, some of the uh, features and benefits, uh, types of different uh, service learning. So uh, as you see, there's uh, volunteerism. Uh, so volunteerism is um, is just to kind of uh, give you a, a pretty good idea. It's uh, some like a, an, an act that you might do um, that you would be free of service without uh, any type of uh, reward or payment, things like that. It's usually uh, based from um, uh, being able to do that for, for your community. Uh, so that might be um, you know, volunteering at a museum or volunteering to pick up trash for the betterment of the community. Um, so um, kind of looking at service learning, uh, kind of if, if I can just back up here, there is, um, if you want to type, talk about like what it is, if you, if you just break down the actual, um, the two terms, service and learning. So uh, as I mentioned before, you might pick up trash on the side of like, you know, a riverbank or something like that. That's a uh, service. Um, if you if you take that, uh, that like water from water samples or something like that from that uh, riverbank and you, uh, you know, analyze it with a microscope, that's learning. Um, if we look at service learning together, then that would be something like uh, if you would take that, that water sample, uh, analyze it again, um, doing your cleanup efforts and then document your results and send those results to like a local pollution agency, that's, uh, that's what we call service learning. So um, within any of these different areas of, um, of volunteerism that you see, um, you can, uh, that would be like a service learning uh, opportunity. Uh, so community service, uh, in the same vein as uh, volunteerism, uh, community service is a situation where you may um, work with more of a, in a structured environment to be able to um, uh, benefit your community. That might be something like uh, organizing like a blood uh, drive after a national, national emergency, coaching your local baseball team, um, or even you know, doing like a community newsletter, a newsletter for your university or like a service, uh, a news service for your university as well. All right, so um, in an internship, we kind of uh, always uh, talk about internships within, the, um, within our, our discussions with higher education. Uh, many of you guys know that being able to do an internship uh, gives you a lot of opportunity um, uh, within the field that you're actually going to be working in. Um, unlike volunteerism, uh, community service, you'll be able to get credit for the different uh, courses that you'll be able to take. Uh, so that maybe one of the four classes that you would have uh, within your university curriculum would be your intern. That would mean you would go away to like a uh, workplace and you would be able to um, uh, get payment sometimes for the for the work that you're doing, but um, many times that internship will be going uh, specifically into the area of study that you want to go into. So um, within engineering, that might be um, in doing an internship at a engineering uh, um, field uh, or, or field placement or a business or, or something like that. So um, within um, internships, we also talk about co-ops, very similar to uh, co-ops. Um, you're, if you're taking four classes on, in a regular semester, during your co-op, you'll be taking zero classes. So that, uh, so the only thing that you'll be actually doing is your co-op that entire semester. So that entire semester, uh, it's a good, it's a good example. Uh, that entire semester, you would be going to a place of work, uh, maybe with an engineering firm or something like that to be able to, uh, to work directly with that engineering firm. So at the end of that semester, you'll be able to have some really defined uh, skills uh, and also contribute to the work that uh, that engineering firm would be doing. Okay, so uh, when we talk about your practicums and your capstones, um, both of these are, uh, are areas within your course curriculum where you will be able to kind of uh, have a, uh, an opportunity to showcase exactly what you've learned. 
Uh, many times within your practicum, uh, you still go off into you know, another workplace or, or something like that and you will complete like a practicum. Uh, generally, you have like, a, it, it's a mix between like a, a, like a paper or a, another type of project that you would submit. Um, at the same time, uh, it would be um, you being able to have some of these experiential learning programs. Um, and then your capstone. Cap capstone is usually uh, a situation where you would, it's, it's kind of like the, the sum of everything that you've learned maybe in the particular uh, engineering field or STEM program that you would be taking. Uh, so again, it's, uh, it's like a paper that you would end up writing uh, and, or and adding to your por portfolio. Uh, so that when you graduate from your engineering program, your STEM program, that you can submit that uh, to any uh, prospective uh, employers once you'll be able to um, transition out of your uh, undergraduate degree. Uh, field education. Um, many, it's it definitely field education goes in with um, kind of your internships. Uh, is generally more um, materially beneficial to your the student it involves uh, programs that uh, provide students with co-curricular service opportunities related to, uh, but not necessarily fully integrated with your formal academic studies uh, as well. Uh, so as we can see, like all of these things, kind of the, the sum of it is uh, just being able to get real world perspective in your, in your, act, in your occupation, uh, you know, getting some uh, insight focus. Uh, there are many different uh, things that uh, you know, qualities of, um, of service learning and being able to uh, kind of absorb some of these things and being able to uh, apply uh, theoretical knowledge at the same time. Since you're being integrated into the actual field, you have a, a lot of opportunity to learn from the inside out and then have an opportunity as well to reflect on that. Uh, so many times, as we all know, you have an opportunity um, to uh, not, not necessarily learn exactly what you what you are wanting to learn, but then taking that information home, processing it, um, putting it in context, uh, and then being able to um, add that, that knowledge to your, your, your knowledge base, and then go on and obviously learn other things. Uh, you have an opportunity to uh, build your professional network a lot of times within uh, service learning projects. Uh, so if you are uh, doing a service learning program, you're going to be connecting with uh, other people who are interested in the same exact uh, types of work that you want to do. So building your professional network is always a uh, is a, always an excellent thing. Uh, within this as well, you also will establish relationship with mentors, people who are um, who you can you can look up to to learn different things as well. That's an excellent uh, thing to be able to uh, to to put into your uh, knowledge base as well. Uh, we've already, already kind of talked about uh, earning your university credits, uh, gaining new experiences, new skills, um, things like that. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, many times uh, you ask, uh, ask like, how, how is it that you would get involved in some of these different programs or other um, uh, opportunities for you to be able to uh, get connected to um, um, different features and benefits of your uh, the university that you're looking to apply to. Um, so just talk, talk about this a little bit. Uh, so your university career center is an excellent thing. I always say that uh, students um, should come into their college uh, as a freshman, first year student and connect with your career center. It's a uh, excellent opportunity for students to be able to um, get some foundational information, whether that is just how to create a resume, um, how to look for jobs on campus. Um, and then uh, once you get to your, your third year, your fourth year, many times your career center will uh, assist you in finding um, uh, employment outside of your university uh, experience. So when you graduate, uh, find internships, find uh, co-op programs and other service learning opportunities. All right, so uh, another thing that you can do too is that you can look and uh, meet with your uh, academic advisor, connect with them uh, or any other faculties in your programs. Uh, many times, uh, as uh, my colleague uh, kind of uh, alluded to, sometimes you may change your major. Sometimes you might have some questions about the academic program that you're looking to uh, go into. Uh, so your academic advisor is going to be um, the, your best source in doing that. Many times you will be, um, when you 
get to college or university, um, you'll be able to have an assigned academic advisor who will be there for your entire four years. Uh, and uh, they'll be kind of like your, your guide um, to your academic program. So if you do have any of those different questions, um, you need to uh, have um, um, a specific, um, uh, formulate like a specific plan for your academic career. Uh, that's what your academic advisor is there for. Uh, as well, uh, career fairs. Uh, many of you know if you if you go to a college fair, you meet with diff different colleges and um, and, and other universities. Um, the same thing for uh, career fairs. Many times, your university career center. Uh, all Hey everybody, sorry about that. Um, we have uh, Rashad uh, yeah. just informed us his internet just crashed, um, unfortunately. Um, so I hopefully he'll think be able that our internet crashed too. <laughs> sorry, what is that, Yusuf? It. I, I thought it's my internet too. So no, because it like everything Rashad. froze. Okay, so it's yeah. Rashad. Yeah. All right, sorry guys for that. Actually, the same thing happened out here too. The internet just completely frozen. I think it must be a Zoom problem. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. So great. So uh, Scott, do you want to take over? You said. Um, I think we can I don't, move on, and uh, and then maybe yeah. he can join us and finish up when he comes back on. Yeah. If we can move, go to the next slide. Good. So great. So as you can, you guys can see here, this is where we are all located. So we are representing four universities, four different regions of the United States. You can see we are socially distancing on the map as well. So that's great given the situation of COVID. Uh, so there we are. That's where we are located. And with the next slides, we're going to be talking individually about each university. If Rashad won't be able to join us, but we'll be possibly talking about his uh, institution. So that's my university. Stony Brook University is my university. It's, uh, we are a large research comprehensive institution. Uh, we do, uh, that's an aerial view of the campus. Uh, as you can see, a uh, beautiful campus. Uh, you can see that that's the North shore of the, uh, of the island. We, we are located on Long Island, which is um, 60 miles away from the city, from Manhattan and Times Square. Uh, that's 100 kilometers, a little bit more than an hour. A beautiful campus, not really far from the city, but not really that close at the same time. So it's a beautiful uh, location, and uh, it's very known for uh, Long Island. is very known for uh, the beaches, and also known for pizza and bagels, of course. Uh, so what you can see there is our uh, main campus. That's uh, uh, where everything takes place. That's where students live. Where that's where. Uh, we have all classes take place. You can see we even what makes it very special also is uh, the fact that we have a train station on campus, uh, where, which you can take uh, just like walk from your dorm and hop on the train. And if you want to go to the city or you want to go to anywhere else. Um, so we have a train station on campus. Yes. So we have a lot of other stuff 
already offer a campus, so you don't have to really get out of the campus, but that's up to you, of course. Um, so as I said, what you see there is only the main campus. We do have also uh, the east side campus. It's separated by the road on the right side of the screen. Uh, and that's where we have Stony Brook University Hospital, which is a research teaching hospital. Um, in terms of ranking, Stony Brook University is ranked among the top 1% in the world. It's also ranked among the top 40 public universities in the United States. Uh, we are actually ranked top one public university in New York State. Uh, we are home of 26,000 students, uh, more than 4,436 international students. We have more than 900 um, students from India that are currently studying, whether at the undergraduate level or the graduate level. Uh, and our campus is one of the largest um, residential population in the SUNY system. Uh, the SUNY here stands for the State University of New York. Uh, in, uh, in the New York, uh, there are CUNY, institutions and there are SUNY institutions. What does that mean? The only, uh, the, the common thing about these two type of systems, they are all public systems, but all those that belong inside the city, they belong to city of uh, New York, City University of New York. Anything that is outside the city area of New York, um, they belong to a system called SUNY system, but the only if they are public universities, so they will belong. So there are in New York state of there are 62 public uh, or SUNY uh, institutions uh, that are public outside the city. Uh, and Stony Brook University is one of the four largest SUNY uh, research centers, uh, which include Buffalo, Albany, Binghamton, and of course, SUNY Stony Brook is the top one uh, out of them all. So uh, in terms of academic, we have more than 200 academic programs. We're very, very famous for engineering, uh, mainly, uh, uh, computer science, applied math and statistics, and we do have a lot of research opportunities that are there that uh, where students can actually uh, graduate, where students not only graduate with a degree, graduate with a degree and their publication and research will be attached to their names. Uh, we do, we are also very famous for our medical programs and I don't want to pass here without mentioning the fact that Stony Brook University was responsible for the, uh, the, 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 the birth of the, the, the MRI technology. So when you come to Stony Brook University, we'll see the first invented MRI, uh, which is actually in the chemistry building and which won Nobel Prize of Medicine. So um, we do have a lot of medical programs, School of Medicine, School of Dental, School of uh, uh, Nursing and School of Health Management and Technology. Uh, we are also uh, a lot famous for journalism, business, uh, and, and so on and so forth. In terms of scholarships, we do have a wide range of scholarships available to international students. We do have the You Are Welcome Here scholarship that covers 50% of the tuition fees. We also have the uh, merit-based scholarship and the merit-based scholarship here where you are automatically reviewed for them. Plus, um, in the merit-based scholarship, we have the... Uh, the scholars scholarship and the honors scholarships and also the wise scholarship that is designed specifically for women, female students studying the STEM field. Uh, with that also I have, uh, we have the needed based scholarship which is offered to all international students. You don't have to provide it with bank statements. You don't have to provide it for CSS profile. All you need to do is just send us an email or fill out a small form and we will uh, consider you for additional scholarship under the need based scholarship. Um, with that, uh, I will leave it here and move it to my friend. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're traveling all the way to the north central part of the US in Minnesota. Um, again, my name is Elizabeth from Minnesota State University, Mankato. And just a brief overview about our campus and our programs. Um, we are a public university. Um, and so our enrollment is a mid-sized institution. We enroll about 14,000 students. Um, about almost 10% of that is our international students representing over 90 countries. So we're very proud of the diversity on our campus and our students are doing great things. Um, we're actually ranked as one of the top universe, 20 universities for undergraduate research. So we mentioned focusing on research programs within engineering. You of course have that opportunity to be partnered with a faculty mentor or join a research cohort team 
um, to continue ongoing campus projects um, based within our undergraduate research center. And then each year we also send teams of our students to the national conference for undergraduate research within the United States. Um, and for the last several years, our research teams have placed in the top presentations at that national conference. So we're really proud um, of the research that's being done by our, our bachelor students on our campus. Um, and of course, our graduate students as well um, through their programs. So when you're thinking about engineering programs, um, we do have several concentrations within engineering, including automotive engineering technology, civil engineering, computer engineering, electrical, manufacturing engineering technology, and of course, mechanical engineering. Um, and I will mention some of these programs where you see um, that there's also a master's degree offered with them. They are a combination program or a dual degree program. So you do have the chance, if you're interested in going on for a graduate degree in one of those programs, you could do three years of your undergrad. And then your fourth year, you would combine both master, uh, master's and bachelor degree courses um, and shorten your overall bachelor and master's program to five years. Um, and so that's an accelerated option that we have for students thinking about going on for those master's degrees. Um, and then being a state institution, we are relatively affordable, um, as well as given our location in the Midwest of the United States. Our average cost of attendance is around 25,000 US dollars per year. Um, and that includes tuition as well as living costs. And we do have scholarships for international students for their first year. We have the Guaranteed Scholarship, which is the International Maverick Scholarship. Um, and you can receive the scholarship upon admission and maintain it each year that you meet the requirements. And then once you're a current student, there are, of course, additional scholarships that you can apply for through your academic program. Um, and we have specific scholarships for students within engineering as well as a women in engineering program um, scholarship. So with that overview, I will um, transition it to my colleague, Scott. Great, thank you, Liz. Appreciate it. Um, well, uh, good to be with you again. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Scott McClama. I'm the International Recruitment Manager at Pepperdine University. Uh, Pepperdine is located in Malibu, California, which is uh, part of the greater Los Angeles area. So uh, just a little bit outside of uh, the main city of Los Angeles, probably about 30, 40 minutes uh, by car uh, to get to LA from Malibu. Uh, but as you see from that photo, uh, we are not uh, in located, you know, in the city. Um, very beautiful location. In fact, um, Pepperdine has been uh, ranked consistently is uh, one of the most beautiful campuses uh, in the nation. Uh, and rightly so, uh, we're uh, situated just uh, in the foothills of the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, which you see off to the right in that photo. And then to the left is the Pacific Ocean. Um, so a uh, number of uh, beautiful beaches uh, within walking distance of the campus. Um, as I mentioned during my, my presentation, Pepperdine is a liberal arts institution, uh, a bit on the smaller side. So we have around uh, 3,500 students in our undergraduate student body. Um, we also have four graduate schools as well. Um, in, the, uh, in the undergraduate school, um, it, we um, offer 44 different majors uh, and engineering is one of those uh, majors. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit um, about about engineering um, at Pepperdine since, since that is, uh, you know, what you are are here for. Um, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, our engineering program is a 3-2 program, uh, which means that you attend Pepperdine for three years um, and uh, you uh, fulfill your general education requirements um, as part of the liberal arts uh, education. Um, and you also fulfill your, all of your uh, kind of uh, math and uh, math prerequisites, um, well not prerequisites, but your math requirements um, for earning your engineering degree. Um, so you kind of do all of that uh, at our, on our campus for three years. Uh, and then if you, uh, you will earn a, a bachelor's degree within those three years, a bachelor's degree of natural science. Um, if uh, your GPA is a, at least a 3.0, uh, you can, um, uh, go on to uh, to the engineering school at uh, University of Southern California. Um, if you have a minimum GPA of 3.25, uh, you can go to the Washington Washington University, which is in St. Louis, um, or you could also go to to uh, University of Southern California uh, as well um, to their engineering to, to their school of engineering uh, and earn your specific um, uh, engineering degree 
uh, and there's a lot of different options uh, depending on what you're uh, you know focused on mechanical electrical industrial um, systems engineering chemical biomedical computer um, and uh, a lot of uh, other others as well um, uh, so Pepperdine uh, we have a lot of students that, that do kind of go through this uh, program um, and um, and, and, and have a great experience, um, able to, to participate in research uh, during their first year uh, as freshmen, uh, participate in groups uh, of eight to 15 students working with a professor uh, doing research in this program. Um, our professors have a lot of connections to, uh, to various corporations and industries and, and, and help our students get, uh, get placed in employment. Um, so we have, there's connections with uh, NASA. We've had uh, students recently that have graduated from this program that, that go on. Uh, to work at NASA, um, Northrop Grumman, um, uh, SpaceX uh, as well. Um, a lot of these are, are kind of based in the California area. Um, some of them um, are um, uh, students are back on the East Coast uh, in these companies. Um, and then there's also um, some connections to Silicon Valley as well for uh, computer engineering. Um, so that's just kind of a brief little overview of Pepperdine and, and engineering at Pepperdine. Um, and I would be happy to answer uh, any questions. Um, please uh, feel free to uh, take down my contact information and, um, and yeah. And now I'm gonna hand it back. It looks like Rashad is, is back with us. So Rashad, take it away. All right, so um, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> so not sure exactly what happened, but uh, back now. Good to be back with you. Uh, so I'm uh, with Missouri Western State University. Um, we are in the center of the US um, uh, in uh, just north of Kansas City. Uh, is our major major destination uh, or major city in our region. Uh, so one of the good things about uh, Missouri Western is that we are known as Missouri's only applied learning university. So um, what that means is percent of the students who get done with a degree at Missouri Western will have a uh, applied learning um, uh, experience, whether that be your internships, your co-op program, service learning, uh, and other things. Uh, you uh, have the option to, of, uh, of about uh, 100 different majors and minors uh, graduate programs. You can see also that we have about uh, 5,000 undergraduate students. Uh, so with our, uh, within our school, our top engineering programs, as you can see by bottom right hand corner, is uh, construction engineering, manufacturing engineering, uh, many different programs in engineering technology, civil and mechanical engineering. So. Uh, we do have uh, many Fortune 500 companies um, in our region, in St. Joseph as well, where we are as well as in Kansas City, not too far away from us as well. All right, so um, for a four-year um, uh, U.S. university, we're pretty inexpensive. Uh, uh, total cost of attendance with your uh, tuition, housing, meals, health insurance, and books is uh, $26,180. So um, um, we do have an automatic scholarship, but our Global Griffin Guarantee Scholarship goes up to $6,000 per year. That is a merit-based scholarship, and uh, every student will be considered for it if they have a GPA over a equivalent 3.0 GPA. Um, we do have a full ride scholarship as well, our International Global Scholars Award. Uh, it is a need-based scholarship, but it pays for everything, uh, which is all of the, the total cost. Uh, it, it, there is only one of these scholarships that is available, and it is it does go to a need-based applicant. Uh, so there may be there is a separate application for that, um, and then you have to uh, fill in uh, like a financial disclosure uh, with that as well, just to prove the need-based uh, status. Um, for admissions or for scholarship, there is no SAT required, uh, so that uh, you'll be able to. Um, have full access to uh, the admissions to our university as well as uh, not having to worry about uh, submitting a, a, a standardized test or like your SAT or ACT. Uh, so with that, I think we'll go back and take some questions. Right. Uh, universities kindly proceed uh, to the questions. Um, there is still time available. I know it's one hour, but uh, students have been informed uh, that you know, the Q&A will come after the one hour presentation. So they'll be looking forward to um, uh, getting answers from you directly. Thank you. Great, thanks Kunal. All right, we'll try to go through and um, see there's quite a few questions that you've submitted. Great questions. So we'll moderate these and hopefully get everyone an answer. Um, but I just wanna note that I put up our contact information for each of our institutions. 
So please feel free to reach out to us if you do have any specific questions about the information we've shared with you today. Um, so for, for the first question from Rahul, um, how can we combine STEM with humanities as mentioned in um, our presentation? If anyone would like to take that question. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, it has a little bit kind of to do with, uh, with what I was mentioning. So um, that's a great question. And that's kind of uh, the idea of, of liberal arts education um, is, is combining, um, combining the humanities with, um, with whatever specific field uh, that you're interested in. So if you go to a liberal arts uh, institution, um, you will be combining, uh, uh, you know, if you study engineering um, or math, um, or physics, you know, science at, at a uh, liberal arts institution, you will be combining that. It'll be uh, all around you. Um, you know, there will be general education requirements that you will meet uh, in the humanities. Uh, and then you will also be able to kind of, um, you know, choose and, and, and add on to that. Uh, you could even uh, do a double major uh, or you could do a minor um, in a humanities related uh, field um, or just take, you know, elective courses that, that do that. So. Um, you know, that's kind of one way to do it. Um, and I believe, I think Yusuf, maybe you had mentioned something about that in your presentation as well. Oh, you're, you're on, on mute, mute you see. Oh, I, I was just sorry. I was just saying like, it's, it's pretty much, yeah, pretty much the same thing for Stony Brook University as well. All right, great. Um, and then Sneha had, had a question for research opportunities. Will these be part of the studies like co-ops or will these be like an assistantship during the semesters? Um, let's see, Rashad, would you like to answer that question? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. For research opportunities, will these be part of the studies like co-ops or will these be like assistantships during semesters? Oh, well, uh, thanks for the question. Um, it's honestly, it's all of the above. Uh, as far as research is concerned, um, many times students will, um, will seek out these opportunities, uh, either connecting with their professor um, or uh, different options like that. So a lot of it, it comes down to exactly you know the, the types of situations that you can find uh, as well as um, any options that you might have uh, sp specifically related to the course schedule that you'll be taking too so um, it's a it's not necessarily the same at all universities so a lot of the opportunities that you'll have uh, from university to university um, will will definitely vary uh, at Missouri Western uh, many of these opportunities uh, for research, uh, like as I said before, will go, um, you'll, you'll be finding a lot of these uh, with the connections to our professors in our uh, career, sometimes our career center. Great, thanks. Just one of the advices that I would highly recommend when uh, students want to like uh, get involved in research and stuff. So, um, there are some questions definitely that needs to be answered by the student themselves. For example, uh, like, do I want, am I, am I ready for, for taking uh, the, cha in the challenge? And do I want to uh, use the summer, for example, and get involved in a lot of research? Because there are a lot of research that are actually available during the summer and students would want to actually plan ahead for that. So uh, also, uh, in finding research, I also always encourage students to talk as much as they can to their professors and department, uh, visit their, the department websites and look at the opportunities, uh, research opportunities, because that's where they will be posted. Send emails, of course, to talk to other students in your major, uh, because uh, many students report learning about research and studio place, uh, placement through their peers. Uh, some departments may have uh, listings, uh, available positions like psychology and others, or may have special training sessions and workshops in biology. Uh, so it's very important to go to research events, uh, chemistry research day or departmental, like we have here at Stony Brook University's departmental seminars, I would say. Uh, 
And it's also keep in mind that uh, faculty members may advise you to take a few more courses or serve as a uh, apprentice uh, before undertaking a project. Uh, and that's, those are kind of things that despite the competition uh, that is there, of course, from other students uh, for certain positions, assistantships. So be, be mindful of all of this. All right, great. Um, so say I asked, I'm unsure about my major that I should pursue. By which year am I supposed to declare the same? Um, and I can start answering this question. Um, depending on which year you are in high school right now, you probably have already been thinking about um, some of the programs you might be interested in studying. And so what I would do is start narrowing down that list of areas that you're really interested in. You don't have to make that decision yet in high school, but start thinking about the types of majors or career paths you're interested in. Um, since you're part of this presentation that's focused on engineering, I'm assuming engineering is one of the majors you're thinking about or STEM related program. So going back to our presentation um, and what my colleagues talked about earlier, if you're considering a STEM major, even if you haven't made up your mind about that yet, you should start preparing um, for that career path by taking as many math and science courses now as you can during your high school. Because later on, in, um, if you decide to go for a STEM or an engineering degree, you'll have that foundation already laid out um, to pursue that major later on by taking those math and um, science-based courses. And you can always change your major, but it's much easier to go from um, focusing on engineering and then changing to a humanities or social science major than it can be the other way around. Because if you start at the university and you're behind in mathematics, you can still um, pursue an engineering program, but that could delay or extend your overall program and the length of time if you have those foundation courses um, that you have to catch up on. So again, that's my recommendation, just narrowing down your focus. Um, but if you are considering STEM, think about focusing on STEM um, prep courses for, for your programs. Would anyone like to add to that? All right, we'll jump to the next question. Um, Supriya, she asked, what is the breakup in terms of my curriculum? How many subjects will be liberal arts based? and how many would be computer science based? That's a great question as well. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. So um, it does kind of vary from institution to institution. Uh, some have more uh, robust general education uh, requirements. Um, like Pepperdine, we actually have a pretty, uh, a pretty strong one. Um, so I, I would say anywhere from one third to uh, two thirds. Uh, you know, and, and some of them may be about half, uh, half of your, your courses, it's about, half, it's about 50, 50. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, it, it varies. So anywhere from one third to two thirds of your, your courses could be um, in, your, in your major. If anyone wants to follow up on that. And I'll mention um, to you on, oh, go ahead, Rochelle. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll just, just really quickly add, um, so that when, when, you're, when you come into your university, um, uh, courses and you start to build your schedule, um, you are in control of what classes that you take. Uh, so you're not automatically signed up for uh, a specific course load that you're going to take, um, you know, from year one to year four. Um, so you do have uh, some, flexibi some flexibility in doing that. Um, definitely when it comes to a lot of the STEM fields, uh, it can uh, it can still be a little bit more, uh, you, you have to build this with your academic advisor because obviously um, if you're taking biology, you wanna go to biology one, two, three, four, whatever, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you have to make sure that the courses that you're going to be take are gonna be offered in the semester that um, it, it's gonna be offered in this, that specific semester. So. That's really the only thing that you have as a barrier to being able to have uh, total flexibility in making up your schedule. But, um, but it, it, it's not a specific, uh, very static roadmap um, as it might be in other curriculums uh, many times. 
Perfect. Um, and I was just going to briefly add to that, all of our institutions will have some type of general education curriculum that you have to pursue. Um, and that's part of the liberal arts um, curriculum that many US universities and colleges have on their campuses. So you will have some liberal arts or social science courses that will be part of your program um, throughout that general education course, but the majority of your courses will take place um, with your computer science degree. That will be the bulk of your program. So, all right, uh, next question. Um, Akshaya, Akshaya asks, what are the combination of bachelor and master's degrees that are available at your universities? Um, would anyone like to talk about their combo programs? I can, uh, I can go back to the example for Minnesota State University. Um, we do offer several combination programs. Again, it's an accelerated program to shorten um, your four-year bachelor degree and your two-year master degree into five years. So we do offer combination programs um, in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and automotive engineering technology, and I think also uh, manufacturing engineering. So that would be the accelerated option where in your final year of your bachelor program, you would take a combination of um, bachelor and master level <coughs> courses just to shorten your overall program. Great. So for Stony Brook University, I'm going to actually pull out the list uh, here just so I can uh, give you the accurate information on the, uh, the available majors, uh, which we call them combined majors. So combined uh, degree programs, that's what we, how we call them, that include, so it's pretty much the same thing to what Liz say, uh, instead of graduating in four years plus and adding two years, you graduate in five years with both. Uh, a master's degree and a bachelor's of science. So uh, the available programs that we have at SUNY Stony Brook are applied maths and statistics, applied maths uh, and statistics plus public health. So you get a BS plus MPH. Um, we do also have art history and criticism, atmospheric science and ocean, oceanic sciences, marine atmospheric sciences, biochemistry, biomedical engineering, chemistry, civil engineering, computer engineering, computer engineering, and electrical engineering combined, where you get the bachelor's of engineering plus master's of science, computer science, earth science, uh, electrical engineering, and a lot, lot more. So um, actually pretty much we have everything uh, in a combined degree program. But uh, more interestingly, we have pretty much all engineering programs, including mechanical, applied math and statistics, computer engineering, electrical and computer science. Cool, great, thanks VC. And uh, at Pepperdine, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have the 3-2 program, which is two bachelor's degrees, but you can add an extra year uh, onto that at uh, one of the partner institutions, uh, Washington University in St. Louis or uh, University of Southern California um, to be a three, three, six year program. Uh, and you add a, a master's degree um, in that extra year for engineering. Um, and we also do have a five year um, MBA program uh, as well, master's of business administration and a bachelor's of business administration. That's actually the same thing I forgot to say about the MBA. So you can also fast track MBA degree programs. So you can earn an MBA along with your choice of undergraduate major. Thank you. Uh, for Missouri Western, we have a combined uh, engineering technology and um, um, engineering program that we do in cooperation with um, another university. Uh, in the Kansas City area. Uh, so you can do a combination of um, civil engineering and mechanical engineering. All right. Um, for the next question, Tina is asking, how would community service work given COVID-19? That's a great question. Would anyone like to start with this one? Um, I'll, I'll say, uh, so there are many different types of uh, community service uh, projects. Uh, so like uh, the example that I talked about was, you know, picking up trash or whatever it is, or doing uh, something with a, a, an organi organization where you might go in. Um, that might be, uh, there might be a lot of uh, different other opportunities for you to be able to uh, apply your skills uh, in other ways for volunteering. So that might be um, working on uh, statistics uh, for an organization uh, that does not have the specialty or, or the, the resources to do some, uh, some analyzation of some, the different data. That might be uh, creating a website or 
uh, many other different types of things. So there's a lot of things you can still do at home uh, to be able to get connected to. And I would definitely say once you are in university, you can still contact uh, a lot of the different um, your, your career center or uh, your academic advisor to be able to maybe uncover some of those opportunities or um, they'll be able to give you uh, some, some different phone numbers that you'd be able to contact uh, people or uh, look into their contact sheet to be able to maybe uh, solicit some of those opportunities yourself. Great, and I would say it's the same for almost all of our campuses too. A lot of the work that's been done in person um, has been able to move online. The organizations that students volunteer with many times are nonprofit organizations. They've found creative solutions to continue their work um, from home. So students and volunteers can maybe help with tutoring um, high school students or elementary students or, or um, something like that. So uh, we'll jump to the next question. Um, Bal Krishna asks, my daughter is planning to pursue an economics major as part of her studies. Would this be considered as STEM too, since it involves math, even though it's from a liberal arts college? All right. Would anyone like to jump in on that question? My daughter is planning to pursue an economics major as part of the, her studies. Would this be considered as a, a STEM too, as it involves math and even, uh, I think it depends on the university and how they classify economics. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I know there are some questions um, and uh, there's kind of a move uh, for, especially when it comes to STEM OPT for economics majors. Uh, some people are trying to advocate for that for economics majors to be eligible for STEM OPT. Um, and I think like UC said, it may kind of vary uh, on the institution. Uh, I think uh, it looks like um, the best way if there's uh, if students major in, in, in something or specify in, in what's called econometrics, which is um, actually more of the, the math based statistical side of economics, um, then it's, it's, it's possible. But, uh, you know, it kind of depends on how the university classifies economics. So, uh, for example, at Pepperdine, our economics uh, major is in our social science division. Um, and uh, so that necessarily wouldn't uh, be considered, uh, you know, a STEM because um, it's more being a social science, it views, you know, eco economics, um, I think rightly so, uh, as, a, as kind of a soft science um, and, uh, and more of a social science rather than like, you know, that hard kind of science, but um, if anyone has anything else to add. Yeah, I would agree. For our campus, um, economics is not considered part of the STEM program. It's within our College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. So it is focused more on that soft social science, like what Scott was saying. Um, but what some students have done in the past is do um, complete a double major. So if they are wanting to combine economics with a STEM programs such as statistics or mathematics, they can do that and you can actually still qualify for STEM OPT um, if you have a double major. So you can use your STEM major as your OPT extension. So that's been a workaround solution for anybody who is um, really adamant about pursuing economics but wants to turn it into a STEM program. Um, but it can vary from campus to campus, um, like my colleagues were saying. Right, um, and then that segues actually really nicely into our next question. Um, Rahul asked, can you discuss the length of OPT for STEM majors versus non-STEM majors? Um, and so with optional practical training, again, that is an, a work authorization benefit for any student who completes their degree program in the US, and that can be at any level. So whether you're coming for an associate degree, bachelor degree, master's, all the way up to PhD, you are eligible to apply for OPT at each level after completion of your program. So if you're pursuing a STEM major, um, any STEM major is eligible for up to three years or 36 months of work authorization. So you first apply for an initial 12 months and then you can apply for an additional 12 month extension and then for a third time for a 12 month extension. So you'd be applying year by year for that three year extension. Um, and then non-STEM majors, they would be eligible to apply just for 12 months of work authorization. So it's just one year 
um, opportunity for that work benefit for any non-STEM programs. Yeah, um, I just want to add, um, going back to the last question about economics, whether it is a, um, when I go, I just visit our website, when I go and see like, because how do you know it's when you get the OPT extension? So I went to our website and uh, checked on our visa and immigration office. And I, we do have like a list of STEM field based, uh, based on the government uh, classification. And I did uh, hyperlink those, um, I did control F to, to just see what, what is available as economics. So what we have is pharma, pharma economics and, uh, and also uh, pharma economics could be considered STEM and econometrics and quantitative uh, economics. Those are the two majors that we have that could be, uh, that will be actually considered STEM for us to get OPT extension. All right, um, and then it looks like there is a question specific to SUNY Stony Brook campus. Um, so just for the sake of time, you see, I'll let you type your answer for that one if you if you don't mind. Um, first, Sneha's yeah, question. Yeah, so. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be very, very quick. So uh, basically for Stony Brook University, we do have a lot of engineering programs. We are uh, part of the National Science Foundation. Uh, the National Science Foundation classifies Stony Brook University, one of the top 10 universities in combining research with undergraduate education. And that's why we've been responsible for more than 2000, uh, uh, re, uh, I mean, inventions. And, and I mentioned earlier that the, uh, uh, the, the MRI technology is one of the great inventions that we are responsible for. All right, awesome. Um, and then Raj, I see you asked a question about the cost of tuition and housing and meal plans. Um, we can each share the link to those specific costs for our university in the chat box. So yeah, I'll add my... is in there already. Um, Perfect. So yeah, the rest of us can add theirs. Awesome. All right, and then Balkrishna asked, I would also like to know more about campus safety um, and housing safety and what would the I-20 costs differ from actual costs as we hear I-20 costs are usually posted on the higher side. So again, that's gonna be a little bit specific to each, each institution. Um, so I think if you guys don't mind, we can all share the links to our estimated cost page as well for overall I-20 costs. Um, and then in the US, each university is actually required to provide statistics about campus safety. So that's a requirement for every college and university. Um, and so when you do go to a specific campus safety website, um, they'll have an annual report that talks about all of the safety and crime rates in, that have taken place on campus. Um, and so all of our campuses seek to create very safe spaces for students. So you can find all that information on our websites as well. All right. Um, and then Shatan asked, how does campus life and activities differ on each of your campuses given the locations? That is a great question, question. too. Uh, yeah, so as, as you noticed, and the, one of the reasons why we put the map up there is just to show uh, kind of the differences, um, you know, of our institutions, and we are all located in, in different kind of geographical areas in the U.S., so uh, you're right, that does lend itself to kind of different campus life and uh, different kind of activities. Um, so I'll start off uh, Pepperdine. Um, as you saw, we are kind of uh, situated in the hills overlooking the ocean. Um, and being in Southern California is very conducive to um, just being outside all the time, year round. Um, even in the winter time, it doesn't get very cold. Uh, so it's a, it's a very kind of outdoor uh, kind of focused uh, community, um, so much so that we um, even have our own hammock club where students basically all they do is just go around and put up hammocks around campus uh, and just chill and enjoy uh, the nice weather and the nice environment. Uh, but a lot of great uh, outdoor activities to be involved in in the area. Um, if you're interested in learning how to surf, uh, you could definitely do that. In fact, you can even uh, check out a surfboard from our campus recreation. Um, uh, but there's a lot, also a lot of uh, hiking around the campus as well. Um, there's really great hiking trails in the mountains um, behind the campus. Uh, so that's just kind of briefly about uh, about Pepperdine. Uh, but again, also we're 30 to 45 minutes away from Los Angeles, so. Um, access to that um, amazing uh, and fun city.
Liz, you're muted. <laughs> For Minnesota State, we're located um, in the north central part of the U.S., so obviously very far away from the coast, so we don't have beaches. Um, like my colleagues in, in California and New York. Um, but Minnesota is a very naturally beautiful state. Um, we also have four seasons, so it does get very hot in the summers, but it also gets very cold in the winters. So that definitely determines the types of activities and campus life that students have. Um, so one of the things that a lot of students um, enjoy actually coming to Minnesota for is experiencing winter for the first time. A lot of our international students have never experienced snow before. And so some of the activities and clubs that we offer actually focus on winter sports. So we have an ice hockey club. Um, so if anybody's interested in trying ice hockey for the first time, they can do that. We also have a skiing and snowboarding club. Um, and so you can actually take classes as well for skiing and snowboarding and get credit for it through the university. So we really try to use the climate and the seasons to our advantage um, to get students involved. But like um, Scott was saying too, there's many different types of clubs focused on specific student interests. And so you'll find something that's academic related, athletics related, um, or culturally related, or just a special interest group that you can join. Um, and so if you don't find a club on our campus and you're interested in starting one, you can also do that if you have at least four other students who wanna join you. So I can let my uh, colleagues yeah. also share. So uh, for Missouri Western, uh, similar to uh, Liz, um, our, our college is uh, in the center of the U.S. So the uh, closest body of water that we have is uh, the um, Missouri River. <laughs> so uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, nature. Uh, and um, like Liz, you were talking about uh, being able to um, have many different different seasons. We are a little bit more um, mild as far as like our, our winters and four seasons, but it gets more hot here. Uh, so we do have a lot of uh, hiking trails and uh, a lot of, um, um, we have the, the Ozarks that are uh, right near us as well, um, that are the, a few hours away. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities as well for students to be able to get involved in um, your different student clubs and organizations. Uh, many times when you come to any university, they're gonna have uh, these types of opportunities uh, and they will uh, vary from where the college is uh, or the university is and um, the different things that they have. But it's an excellent question. Um, and part of what students uh, will do in taking a look at their the college of choice is figuring out exactly where that college is located, what they offer, um, the um, expenses related to, um, to the specific university, um, not only tuition, but also um, living costs as well, um, because of the fact that uh, where you are in the U.S. Uh, definitely um, goes into uh, how much it's going to cost. So um, those are some of the things that you should all be taking under consideration when you're uh, selecting a college. All right, um, it looks like there's a question uh, there related specifically to uh, Minnesota State uh, Mankato. Uh, so Liz, if you could uh, answer that um, directly to that student, um, typing your answer, uh, Rahul. Um, <clears throat> next question, um, can you, please can you share how we can collaborate with faculty in our research projects? Um, also with uh, US English is a bit hard to understand. Um, how can we study with faculty after classes? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of us, uh, most of us, all of us probably have mentioned about uh, research um, and collaborating with faculty uh, in research. Um, so I'll just speak specifically to uh, Pepperdine is, uh, you know, that's um, a, a big thing, a big part of our uh, students' education um, is, is participating directly with faculty uh, in research. Um, and so some of these are formal um, programs. So we have uh, honors research programs that students can apply to be in these, in these programs to where they can do this research and, and have it um, work with a professor to do it and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, informal uh, ways that this happens as well. So professors invite students um, all the time to work on something with them or a student comes up with an idea uh, and, and, and approaches a specific professor and, and says, you know, hey, I have this idea, I would like to, to kind of do this. So 
um, there's several different ways that students get uh, get connected and collaborate with this um, and it's something that is uh, very common and, and happens uh, quite a bit at the university um, definitely a lot of uh, opportunities for students to do that here um, and as far as you know studying with faculty after classes uh, you know, our, all of our professors have uh, office hours uh, that students can schedule to meet with them every week. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the university really hires, uh, really good about hiring professors that kind of want to invest in students' lives uh, in that way and, um, and spend time with them and, and help, you know, almost mentor them in that sense. Um, it's, uh, you know, a great advantage of, of being kind of a smaller size university. And I would say, um, like Scott said, it's pretty much the same across most campuses. If you are interested in research, I would just make that very clear from your first year as you're working with your academic advisors and the faculty in your courses. Let them know early on that you're interested in research. Um, most research tends to take place after your second year at the university once you've had a foundation of some of the courses for your program, um, but some programs might let you start a little bit earlier. So do make that clear. And then also um, with the US English, I know that there can be that language barrier as well. Many of the classes, especially in the STEM fields, do have tutoring options for those introductory courses. So if you're struggling in your um, mathematics course or intro to engineering course or um, English composition course, most of those general education courses um, and engineering uh, courses do offer specific tutoring. So you might not be able to meet directly with your faculty all the time to help answer the questions, but there will be tutors who have taken that class before who can help you out. Um, and they usually have tutoring hours seven days a week um, on our campuses, so you can sign up for those. And then most um, faculty on our US campuses are required to have office hours. Typically it's 10 office hours per week where they are required to just have an open door policy to meet with students. So you can always connect with your faculty um, during those office hours as well if you have specific questions about the class. So I think that wraps up all of the questions. Um, thank you so much for your great questions. These are all um, great things to be thinking about as you're applying to US universities and considering your programs. So um, most of, it looks like all of us have put our information in the chat about our cost of attendance and admission requirements. Um, and if you haven't done so already, there is that link to the form. If you would like to receive follow up information from us, please just put your name and your email and we'll be happy to connect with you about specific details. So um, with that I'll turn it over to you, Kanal. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I'm so sorry to interrupt. There's one question that's coming, I believe, from Sneha. Uh, if you can just, this is, I think I know we've gone over time. Just this is one more question. I'm sorry uh, if it was missed. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, thanks, Naya. Uh, she said, in light of the unfortunate situation of coronavirus, how would admissions, class sizes, like student faculty ratio and housing be affected given the many social distancing rules? That is a great question. Um, would anyone like to start? Um, I think uh, I think the the best way to answer this question is going to be um, it's it, unfortunately it's going to be very specific to the, the the university that you're going to be applying to. Uh, I know that I've gotten m a many um, a, a lot of information on our campus um, just talking about uh, some of our plans as far as social distancing. I know that. Um, some of our classrooms will be uh, not as, as large as they used to be. Maybe they'll be holding larger classes in larger spaces um, so that the, the students will be able to uh, observe any types of uh, social distancing. Um, housing is, um, is, should not necessarily be a problem on our campus because of um, our availability, but that's going to change from college or university to university. Uh, so the best thing to do is uh, if you are looking to uh, a, a specific college to ask these questions to that that university so that you'll be able to get the uh, the best information um, as 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 many of you know there's there's thousands of different colleges and universities in the united states so it's definitely going to be different from um, each so um so just take that into consideration and um when you're in starting to uh, your your university planning.
That's a definitely a great question. And just like to say from, to answer that question from Stony Brook University's perspective. Uh, so students that will be coming joining us this fall, they will be coming two weeks early. They will be quarantining and Stony Brook University it will be taking care of that, uh, the quarantine. So we have reserved students have already like uh, confirmed and they will be staying uh, uh, for two weeks. And then at the same time while they're staying, they will be also doing their orientation and classes for two weeks before they start officially their classes on the 24th of August. We've been doing a lot of things, uh, a lot of changing, a lot of uh, changes to our guidelines in terms of social distancing and keeping everyone safe. Basically, New York is going on the, the right track and we are way below the uh, uh, the peak and, and and we overcome all those uh, those uh, problems already. So basically, um, we have a large campus and we are not one of the things that we have decided is no longer have more than two per room. So we do no more triplets. There will be only like uh, one room for two students only. That's one example. And it'll be very similar to, for Minnesota State Mankato as well. We'll. Um, provide the opportunities for quarantining if that's a requirement for any student coming in um, to Minnesota State Mankato. And then also we'll have the flex sync option for our classes to make sure that social distancing is available. Um, and that's going to be a hybrid format where part of the class will take in-class on-campus um, classes and then the remaining class will have the option to take it online and that can rotate throughout the semester. So you might have the opportunities to physically come to campus for some of your classes others will um, stay online from home. So as far as student faculty ratio, what that's going to look like, we don't have all those specific details yet. Um, but again, like Rashad was saying, it's really good to connect with the individual university you're applying to to find out what their plan is um, and even reach out to the academic departments to the professors and the faculty from the department can help answer some of those specific academic questions that um, admissions counselors might not know all the details of yet. Yeah, and I'll just briefly state for the upcoming semester, which doesn't, uh, what shouldn't affect in, uh, any of you um, that, are, that are watching this, uh, but uh, just for the fall 2020 semester, Pepperdine is uh, gonna be fully uh, online. Um, so no, no worries there about uh, social distancing, um, and then moving forward in the future, I know in the spring 2021 term, uh, planning on being back on campus, uh, but with a lot of social distancing uh, measures uh, in place, smaller class sizes, even doing, you know, holding some classes uh, outside, uh, even I know there's been some discussion on that. Um, yeah, but, but certainly reach out to the, the institutions you're interested in and they can give you the specifics. Yeah, definitely just wanna add quickly, uh, uh, the four institutions that you see here today, they're all like not based in the city. So, um, and where you could see a strict, um, strict guidelines because that's, those are the location where, locations where uh, density is really high. So we are always, all of us like outside um, like uh, the city. So, and that's actually makes things really perfect. Like, as you can see, the, it's like open air and uh, open space, loud space and, and stuff like that. So it's, uh, it's very important to consider the location, especially at the current times of the COVID-19. Great, I think um, that was really wonderful. I mean, thank you to all the four panelists uh, for, you know, I know it got extended by about a 30, 30 to 40 minutes uh, due to the Q&A. So thank you so much for taking your kind time and answering uh, the many questions that the students and parents have been having. Uh, students, parents, thank you so much to you as well. Uh, we know it's uh, nearly 9.30 p.m. in the night out here in India. So thank you so much for staying back uh, so late for uh, asking your questions, engaging uh, with the panelists. And also I can see many of you have shared your email addresses. So I'm really hoping these con uh, conversations continue well past uh, this uh, workshop session that we've organized. Having said that, thank you once again to Elizabeth, UC, Scott and Rashad for your kind time and support in participating and giving, uh, giving us almost an hour and a half of your uh, very valuable time. Um, this session will be recorded as you know, and we'll be sharing the recording link. Students, parents, counselors, this session will be shared with your schools as well so that other students who were not able to participate this evening will also be receiving uh, the recorded links as well.
Having said that, I think it's a wrap for the day. Thank you to all the attendees and our wonderful panelists for putting up a wonderful show today. I wish you all the best. Please take care, stay safe, and look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thank you once again. Thanks, Kunal. Thank you all. So much. Thank you all. Everyone. Take safe. care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.